You and I exist because of the goodness of God. You and I have been born again because of the goodness of God. Our souls are being saved because of the goodness of God. David recognized that a uh, long time ago, and he said, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He's good. God said to Moses when he was up on Mount Sinai, Moses said, I want to see your glory. I want to see you in your glory. And God said, Moses, you can't see me in my glory in this physical body and live. He said, but I'll cover you with my hand. And as I'm going away, he said, I'll let you see me from the back parts. God said to Moses, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. All. Notice the word that I put it in capital letters. I will show all of my goodness because I've come to realize that the goodness of God is an all-inclusive term for so many things, attributes about the character, the nature of our God. David said this, God, you are good and you do good. Two important aspects of that word, and I hadn't really thought of it in that context. Another principle in the New Testament says, he that is righteous will do righteous things. Well, this is the principle, and it comes from this. God is good, and he does good things. And so I want to emphasize this morning about the goodness of God, these attributes about who he is. His attributes are this, he's a just God, he's fair, he's a righteous God, does all the appropriate, fair, beneficial things, he's pure, there's, there's no impurities in him, uh, I don't know, was that Ivory used to have a commercial 99% pure, well that's not good enough for God, 100%, he is pure, and he is holy. He's just above and worthy of our worship and admiration. God is love. You know, we say, well, God has this amazing love for us. Yeah, that's because he is love. It's like we could say the sun is light or the sun gives light. Well, the sun gives light because it is light. The sun gives off heat because it is a burning ball of fire. God gives love because he is love. And because of his love, he is compassionate. He has this compassion within him, and he's full of grace. The word for grace is about giving. And because of what he is, then his actions follow along with that. And he's kind, he's benevolent, he's giving and sharing, and he loves us because he is love. And he's merciful because he is filled with his character, his nature is one of mercy, and he redeems us because of that great love. See, all of these things together, and many more, I only had a limited list there, all of these things together comprise the goodness of God. I played before church one of my favorite songs, I love you, Lord. Your mercy never fails me all my days. You've been good and you've been faithful. And I will sing of the goodness of God as long as he gives me breath. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. See, number one, God is truth. Uh, here's Deuteronomy, Moses wrote this. He is the God of truth, he is just, fair, and he is righteous. Those are attributes of who he is, this is his nature. He's always been there from the very beginning and this is just who he is. Um, Romans 3, Paul said it again in the New Testament, God is righteous and just, and he's the justifier of those who believe in his son, Jesus Christ. God is just, and we are to be justified or having favor or right privilege and approval in his sight, not because of what we do, but because of what he does. You know, I've kind of joked with people you know, I have a lot of people asking for money online, different ministers uh, overseas, whether it's Thailand, Laos, India, Pakistan. 
And I, boy, if I had the money, I'd give it. You know, I, I've told people, I've kind of joked, well, I can't give you a million dollars because I don't have a million dollars. Now, if I had a billion dollars, I'd probably, I, I wouldn't mind giving you all a million. But I don't have it. Because you can't give away what you don't have. There's a reason why, one of the reasons why I don't believe God's the author of sickness and disease. God can't give somebody cancer. God can't give somebody COVID. He don't have it. He's healthy. He's the epitome of health and, and success and a wholeness. And <clears throat> God can't sin because it's not in him. It's not in his nature. And God can justify us. And we'll talk about the reason he does that and some of his other attributes. But we can't make ourselves just, but he gives us that sense of righteousness. And we're justified because of him. As I mentioned, God is pure. Not 99% of the time. All of the time. 100% of the time. He's 100% consistent. There's no deviation. Hebrews says... He's the same yesterday, today, forever. There's no variableness. No, well, I changed my mind about that. God has this consistency about him. And he's pure light. He's pure goodness. He's pure mercy. He's pure justness. Pure holiness. It, there's a song or we sing here that says he's altogether lovely. All together, everything about him is lovely and pure. Psalm 102, David recognized that you are the same. Malachi says you cannot change. He cannot change. Um, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. The same from the beginning all the way through till we see him in all of his glory and his holiness. See, God is absolute light, 1 John chapter 1. And in him is no darkness at all. Now, I've come over here sometimes at night and it's dark in here. And if the moon is shining, there's light coming in the windows. But if the moon's dark, then it's really dark in here, except for this little street light out here, or the light out on the sign lets in a little bit of light. But have you ever got up in the middle of the night when there's no moon, you have no lights on in your house, and you stumble around to get someplace and stub your toe? I've done that many times. Uh, it hurts. But God is light, and in him there's no darkness. I mean, what is the definition of darkness? The absence of light. Satan is darkness, because in him there's no light. He's all darkness. Satan is a liar, and there is no truth in him. God is truth, and he cannot lie. See, it's, it's all or nothing. And... God is pure righteousness, pure holiness, pure love. And because of that, as his essence, because that's who he is, that's what he gives out. God is a holy God, which means separated from all sin, separated from all the darkness or evil. Uh, there's pure holiness in him. And... He's separated from anything that's evil. In fact, here's a verse in Psalm 5. It says, sin cannot dwell in him. Or, I looked up the Hebrew word, it also means sin cannot dwell with him. We could not go to heaven and live or exist in his presence in these bodies. Because that sin nature was passed on. And that's why we have to be born again. We have to be changed. We have to be transformed. And the old nature dies. If anybody's in Christ, the old is passed away. Dead. Gone. And there's a newness in it. We are a new creation. Because 
sinners could not go to heaven. They shouldn't want to go to heaven because they would be immediately consumed by the goodness, the glory, the majesty, the holiness of God. Our only hope of going to heaven is to receive his divine nature so that we can be and exist on the same level that he is. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again or you can't enter into the kingdom of God. We have to be changed. God told Moses that you can't see me in my glory and live. See, God laid aside his glory to talk with Moses. Jesus laid aside his glory to come and be born in Bethlehem, to walk and talk with men and demonstrate. On the Mount of Transfiguration, they got a little glimpse of Christ in his glory, and wow, they were so impressed. We, we need to stay here. They saw him when he ascended back into heaven, <clears throat> and he said, I'll be back, and I'll come and take you to be with me. Because... Jesus knew that you must be, you had to be changed, born again, get that new spirit on the inside, or you can't live or dwell in his presence. For example, Kennedy, how long would you last on the sun? You couldn't walk on the sun, you couldn't exist in the presence of the sun because of its brightness, because of its heat. Uh, we're not even supposed to look directly at the sun because it'll damage this physical body. We cannot see and experience or dwell in the presence of the glory of God in these fallen sinful bodies. This fallen nature has to be erased and we have to be changed and transformed into that divine likeness. God is holy and that's why it says in two or three places, that without holiness, you'll never see God. God said, I want you to be holy as I am holy. We can't do that by our conduct because holiness comes from an inward, innate, dwelling holiness. Because God is love, he does loving things. Because God is holy, he shares that holiness with us and it's the only way we can fellowship with him. For example, um, John, when was the last time you had a conversation with the ants outside your house? You don't communicate with them? You don't speak their language? My dad has said the only way you can communicate with the ants or the bugs is to become one. Go down to their level and be one of them and warn them about some danger or event that's going to happen. And as ridiculous as that sounds, <clears throat> that's what Jesus did for us. Let this wonderful, majestic level of holiness and glory came down to the level of us sinful bugs to communicate and tell us about the dangers that were ahead of us if we didn't change our direction. Because he wants us then to be saved from the judgment, the wrath that's coming, so that we can become like him to live and dwell with him. There's only one way to become holy, and that's to receive the gift of holiness on the inside of us. Jesus has gone back to the Father and his glory and his holiness have been restored. And so when we receive Christ, when we ask for his divine nature to come on the inside of us, we become holy because he's holy on the inside of us. Same way when you take your medicine. You can have it in a bottle, you can possess it, you can have it on the shelf, and it's paid for, and it's there, and it's available, but it doesn't benefit you until you get it on the inside of you. And the divine nature, this gift of holiness and righteousness, is there, and it's available to us, but only when we take it and receive it on the inside, it becomes a part of us. And we become holy because he is holy, and we're changed and transformed. The amazing love that Jesus had to leave that glory and come down and walk amongst the lowly like us. Even 
Amazing Grace says, that saved a wretch like I. Or the phrase in the Bible is a worm like I. A bug. Jesus came down from his glory to become amongst us as lowly as the insects are in our life. <coughs> Love is God's nature. It's Christ's nature. It's the nature of the Holy Spirit. All of these three are the same. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because everything that I say and do is what the Father says. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he won't speak of himself. Like Kevin was saying, I didn't want to make this about me. It's about him. The Holy Spirit comes to guide us and teach us in truth about our Lord, about our Father God. The three are one in purpose and unity. They're the same in nature and passion, and, and these characteristics are true of them all. God is love. He loved so much that he gave. Jesus is love. He loved so much that he gave. The Holy Spirit is love, and he loves you so much. He came to guide and to teach us into truth. One of the translations I like of John 3.16 says this, God loved us so much, God loved us in this way that he gave his only begotten son. When you love, you give. When you love, you care. When you love, you want to help. God loved us, and, and he made a plan for us to know and experience his goodness, his salvation. You know, the Lord came to you, Kevin, a lot of years ago in your drunken state, and led you to a place of repentance and fellowship. That's true for all of us. God used some event in our life, whether it's mom and dad or grandpa and grandma, a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, an event, a circumstance. <clears throat> God's desire is to bring us to that pace, place where we say, this is not about me, this is about him. This is not about what I can do, it's about what he has done. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. We're looking back. You know, people in the Old Testament were saved by looking forward to a Messiah, a Redeemer. Job said that, I know my Redeemer lives, and one day I'm going to see him face to face. Job had a revelation of a Messiah that was coming. The prophets talked about him. Isaiah talked about him. All of these prophets had a vision of the Messiah who would come. And every lamb that was sacrificed, every dove, every bull, every animal that was shed its blood, was shedding its blood looking forward to the blood of Christ. And they were saved by faith looking forward to the blood of the lamb. The blood of goats and animals couldn't cleanse them from sin, but their faith was a covering. And they were saved by faith looking forward to the cross. You and I are saved by faith looking back to the cross, to the blood that God's Son shed on our behalf. We have a God of compassion, and because he's full of compassion, this empathy leads him to action. Jesus looked over a city, and he was moved with compassion. Jesus looked on the multitude that was hungry, and he was moved with compassion. Jesus looked at those who were leprous or lame or blind and says he was moved with compassion. See, loving leads to compassion and empathy a caring that leads to action. We'll talk more about that next week because God is the God of mercy. He's a God of help. He's a God of comfort. Because of his love, the nature, the character of his love, it leads him to these actions that we'll talk about next week. We have a God who is inherently full of grace, a God who is full of compassion, and because of that passion, compassion, he's willing to give. And my dad's definition of grace was an undeserved, unmerited favor or gift. And that's what God gives us, things that we don't deserve. Because of his grace, we get things that we don't deserve. Because of his mercy, we don't get what we do deserve. Because of grace, we get salvation and eternal life. Because of mercy, we don't get hell and eternal damnation. God's grace is this amazing desire he has to give and to give and to give. 
Grace and mercy came through Jesus Christ, and God revealed it all through his Son. Even salvation, Paul said in Ephesians 2, by grace we are saved through faith, not of ourselves, lest we would boast. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of God. I'm so very grateful that his compassion allowed him, caused him, motivated him to overlook my sin and to say, oh, let's see. Oh, oh, I do see some good in there. I can use this. And God's grace and goodness overlooks the bad in our life so that he can focus on that good. You know, another saying from my dad, I've quoted it many times, God's primary concern is what he can make out of you in eternity. He sees something good in you that caused him uh, to bring salvation to you. We're justified by his grace. It's a gift, justification. We have this right standing. He is just, and because he is just, and because of his love, he justifies us so that we can stand before him in this place of privilege. Or James said this, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. The angels that he sent to watch her that night, Kevin. The angels that were there the night I was born. The angels that surrounded Dave in the midst of his surgeries. Vicki, the Lord was with you the night you were stabbed with that rod up through your stomach. The angels of God encamp around those who are the children of God. You say, well, why do some Christians die from disease or accidents? Don't know. I don't know. I've thought many times over the years, why did I lose my hand when I was 11 years old? Well, number one, I know I did a dumb thing. I disobeyed instructions and I reached in to do something I'd been told not to do. But in the long run, looking back uh, to that year in 1958-59, God said, I can use that. I'll make something good come from that. All things that God allows in our lives are for a purpose. <clears throat> For him to be glorified, to be him to be edified. Kevin's exactly right. It's not about us. It's about us doing what glorifies him. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. Every gift, every gift. See, here's the fulfillment of that. Um, remember the verse I quoted about Moses? He's up there on Mount Sinai. God's going to give him the Ten Commandments written on stone. And God said, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. All of my goodness. It's a big package. It's everything. All of these things in one. All of my goodness. And I looked up that Hebrew word, pass through you, or pass before you. And the other definitions, God said, I will make all of my goodness pass through you. I will make all of my goodness permeate you. I will make all of my goodness impregnate and dwell within you. All of these things that I mentioned today that God is, that's what he wants us to be. In fact, there's a scripture Paul told Timothy, as Christ is, so are we in this world. When we receive Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead comes to dwell and live within us. Now, it's in an earthen vessel, and we don't see all that God intends us to be in this life, but rest assured, when we see him, we're going to be like him, because God's plan is for us to know everything. And when Moses experienced even just that little moment of God's glory and goodness, he was changed forever. In fact, he came down, it says, he didn't realize it, but when he came down from that, his face was shining so brightly, people couldn't look at him. And he came down to talk to the people, and they put a bag over his head. They put a, a, a shield over his face, because Moses, with that moment in the presence in the glory of God, was shining so brightly with the glory of God that they said, we couldn't even look on him, and they had to put this covering over his face. But there's only one way to find out the goodness of God. I can tell you about it. The Bible talks about it. There's plenty of preachers talked about it. But the only way is this one, Psalm 34. Taste and see 
the Lord is good. Kennedy, she's going to be my helper today. Would you come up here? Here's the ingredients. Here's, here's what it is. Sugar, wheat, soybean, oil, orange, eggs, food starch, cranberries, baking soda, corn syrup, salt, whey, citric acid, soy, on and on and on with a bunch of other chemicals. That sound good to you? No. No. Oh. It's good, really good. I, I know it's good because I've experienced it. I know it's good because I've tasted it. Here's the point. You and I know how good God is. You and I know all these characteristics and attributes and, and we can tell people, boy, the goodness of God is the most amazing thing. And they say, yeah, right, yeah, I believe. There's only one way to know, and that's to taste and see. So here's this cranberry orange muffin. Have you had one? Does it sound good? <laughs> Well, there's only one way to find out. Take a little bite there. Just, yeah. Good? It's not bad. You didn't think you'd like it, and yeah. <laughs> and see, now you're proved wrong because here's all the ingredients, and, and maybe by themselves they aren't good, but when you put them all together, Make something good. God has an amazing plan and package for your life. He loves you so very much. Taste and see the Lord is good. We are alive. We have eternal life because of Jesus Christ. Taste and see. Sing of the goodness of God.